From primary school, we are indoctrinated to believe that the dictator is our savior and we cannot survive without him. It's really great, uh, Farida Naburema, for you to be with us this, uh, this, this evening. Um, uh, Farida, you're a Togolese democracy and human rights activist. Do you want to just tell us briefly what the status of your fight for democracy and human rights in Togo is at the moment? Um, thank you, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, to be honest with you, um, I will say that um, currently we are in a dark age of our struggle against uh, uh, the military regime in Togo. And by dark age, I mean that um, um, there's no real uh, um, action happening on the ground for, for many reasons. Number one, the civil uh, society groups um, and movements were extremely weakened by uh, 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 severe repression that was unleashed on them by the, the government. We still have uh, over hundreds of, uh, of protesters and activists who are in prison and they have been held for, uh, for several years now. Uh, protests and gatherings uh, were banned in Togo before the COVID pandemic, but then the pandemic gave uh, another good reason to the government to reinforce their uh, 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 ban of, on gatherings uh, and events. Um, even uh, uh, private events such as press conferences or uh, people giving lectures uh, in the university that has a political uh, 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 connotation are banned. Uh, medias are being shut down constantly in Togo. Um, in the past uh, two months, three media were shut down. Journalists are being persecuted. Uh, some of them have fled in exile in the past uh, a couple of months. Um, they are being charged for uh, daring to expose corruption and human rights abuses in Togo. So the situation is, uh, is a really uh, difficult one uh, to operate in as an activist or as a human rights defender. And, and Farida, you yourself have uh, not been able to return to Togo for some time, is that correct? Yes, I haven't been able to return to go to Togo for a couple of years now. And tell us a little bit, I've, I, know, you're, I have to recommend to anyone listening to read your blog, which actually is full of just wonderful, wonderful writing, particularly for for uh, uh, French speakers. It's, it's beautiful writing and it's uh, powerful and it's uh, angry. And one of the pieces that you you wrote was about uh, was about your feelings of patriotism towards Togo. Mm. Um, can you and and your feelings of of pride, but the difficulty of that feeling of pride? Do you want it must be particularly difficult being away mm. and not being able to return in that way mm. to a place mm. you feel so strongly about. Um, that is that is quite true. Um, um, to be honest with you, leaving Togo wasn't a decision that I I made. It was my parents' decision, uh, and I was much younger. Um, and uh, the only way that I I I came to cope with the the decision of me leaving Togo was that. Uh, um, I saw it as an opportunity for me to raise awareness on the ongoing the dictatorship that we are living in in Togo. Um, I was actually greatly uh, 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 surprised and shocked that the majority of the world uh, of, of countries, even surrounding Togo, such as Ghana or, or, or even as close as Nigeria or Benin, they have no idea that Togo is run by a military regime and and we are run by the oldest military regime in Africa. We have been ruled by the same family for the past 54 years. Uh, 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 father, the father ruled for 38 years, and the son is currently the only president serving a fourth term in the ECOWAS region. Uh, um, and, and people sometimes, they assume that because they don't hear from Togo or they don't hear about Togo, it means that we are enjoying our life. We are a very small and beautiful and peaceful country where people maybe go to have fun on the beach and, 
and enjoy themselves. But they have no idea that there has been a struggle going on for decades to demand change and democracy. And then thousands of people have lost their lives in the process and, and, and thousands more are continue to be prosecuted for that. So I saw my departure as, um, as, a, as, as a sacrifice uh, 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 and I wanted to put that at the service of the struggle by, by trying to raise awareness as much as possible, by also trying to attack the pillars, the external pillars of support of the regime uh, 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 outside of Togo and, and trying to mobilize the Togolese diaspora into supporting the work that was being done on the ground by Togolese activists and organizers. And so tell me, what is your what's your theory of change how do you think change happens because as certainly as someone who doesn't is no expert it looks as if you're up against something that's very hard to move where do you how, where where are the weak points how do you attack this system um thank you very much uh, for that uh, great question um i will say that change begins with the citizens um, the moment the citizens believe and understand that all the power that the government has derives and emanates from the masses and the people, and they understand that they can cut the government off that power, they start reclaiming part of that power, and they start liberating themselves. So the hardest part of the work has been and continues to some extent to be to raise awareness among the citizens of Togo that they actually can overcome the regime because the regime has succeeded at creating a whole myth around itself by portraying itself as a regime that is indomitable and invincible. And there is an entire generation of Togolese citizens who for the past 50 years were born and raised under that regime and they have known nothing but brutality, repression, and abuse, and they have come to accept to some extent their condition by thinking that if they dare challenge the government, then they deserve to be punished for trying to demand accountability or change. So the hardest part was to get to convince the youth, especially of my generation, that we are the power and we have to take that power back. And it is only by empowering the youth and the masses that we have started to shift the minds and have started to operate some change at the, at, on the ground. In 2017, Togo became popular in the region for the massive protests that we staged for several months. Um, and for a lot of people, that was the first time that they heard about Togo. But what people do not know and understand that it actually took decades to get the Togolese to the point where they could believe that they have the right to step on the street and to demand change. We live in a country where from, the, from primary school, we are indoctrinated to believe that the dictator is our savior and we cannot survive without him. We are lined up every morning to clap for the president and on the weekend we had to dance for him to celebrate him to praise him and say how grateful we are to have him as a head of state so people who were born and raised and indoctrinated in such way it is hard for them to understand that they can be actors of change and they deserve better and that work took a lot of time but i am very happy that even though today we have not succeeded at ending dictatorship in togo we have been able to shift the minds to the point where the citizens are resisting this dictatorship and are no longer accepting their condition of oppressed can you say a little bit about the the role of the internet in creating this collective sense of agency. Mm -hmm. The internet was an amazing resource for us in so many ways. Um, I 
I am I am happy to belong to the generation, the first generation of internet activists, uh, cyber activists in Togo. In the beginning, of course, nobody took us seriously, both in the masses and even on the sides of the government. But then eventually we started to raise attention and we started to organize actions that had effect and impact on the ground that even the government didn't realize that it was possible. The internet, first of all, gave us a certain shield of protection to start with. When we funded Formas Go, for example, I was the only face of the movement and believe me, when we funded the movement, my comrades in the movement, there were only two of them of whose names and, and, and face I knew. Everybody else was keeping their anonymity. We allowed it because we felt that whatever made people feel safe enough to get involved, then they should go ahead and do that. People were using fake names and uh, um, fake profiles just to be able to use the internet to blog, cyber blog, and criticize the government and raise awareness on human rights abuses. We never questioned people's uh, uh, um, um, uh, background. We never asked them to re expose themselves because whatever make them feel safe, it was the most important thing. Number two, it also closed the gap between the Togolese living in different corners of the world. We have hundreds of thousands of Togolese citizens who have fled over the years. Um, they have fled during the crisis in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, and those Togolese also want to give back to the country and to support the uh, democracy movement. But before the age of the internet, they had no way of doing that. But thanks to internet, you were able to to close the geographic borders and we were able to work together regardless of where uh, we were based. And finally, the internet actually also helped us uh, uh, decentralize the movement and allow people to organize in a very decentralized manner, uh, uh, both in Togo and the diaspora. And it also made the information accessible to all because we were sharing videos and audio messages in our local languages, which are more accessible to the masses than the French that is usually used in newspapers that some can't even uh, uh, um, afford to buy, talk even less of uh, uh, read because they are not necessarily illiterate. So the channels of communication revolutionize the way that we were able to organize. And has, has there been a, a, a counter move by the Togolese state? Because the, the tools that you're describing to organize have also, mm -hmm. after all, been used for surveillance and for breaking activist mm -hmm. networks. Once the state uh, understands that it can uh, use that power on its side, has that been something that has that that has happened, or is a concern in your uh, campaigns today? Uh, for us, it is more than a concern, it is a reality. The Togolese government has actually deployed a very sophisticated surveillance system. Uh, they have purchased a, 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 a surveillance spyware called uh, Pegasus, from, uh, it, which was built by an Israeli firm called uh, uh, NSO, which they used to infiltrate uh, um, um, the platforms of activists to, to spy on activists, journalists, human rights, uh, uh, um, civil society organizations. Uh, uh, leaders as well as uh, uh, political uh, party leaders in the opposition. They have also created an entire team that of trolls that, that goes on the internet to attack activists, to humiliate them, to create fake stories about their lives, such as in my case, for example, I am a prostitute, I am, a, I am the girlfriend of a drug dealer, I am a terrorist and I am a porn star, all those attributes to paint me as a bad woman and as, as a, a, a as an ill, uh, 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 a virtued person. Um, and many activists and organizers have felt the same attacks, the attacks on uh, to their families, the constant threats. So they have a very sophisticated system in place uh, to counter the organizing of, uh, of civil society uh, groups and uh, activists online. But I am happy to say that the Togolese people uh, um, and activists are very resilient because as soon as we realize that that 
threat uh, 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 was real, we decided to find creative ways to communicate and alternative ways to organize. Of course, we still use social media to, to, to promote our work and to mobilize people and to raise awareness in general. But when it comes to making critical decisions about our activities, we know what to do. We, we, we came up with uh, uh, digital security trainings and we invited tech experts who trained our activists on how to use those techs. We even went as far as developing our own alternate uh, uh, messaging system, which doesn't even use the internet so that they wouldn't be able to track us. So the good thing about technology is that it's a double-edged sword. It can be used for good or bad. And we feel like as much as the government is investing in obtaining bad technology to repress citizens, we the citizens can also organize to obtain good technology to continue to organize and resist. Um, Farida, one of the things that, uh, one of the, the, the strands of your commentary on your, on your blog is about uh, European perceptions of uh, Africa and of Togo. And one of those perceptions, it seems to me, is, well, you know, we don't really know what these places are. We don't really know where they are, where these countries are. But what we do know is that they're poor and they need help. And that in a way, that is the, uh, the, the dominant European perspective. And in that mm -hmm. context, it'd be natural to think democracy, human rights, ah, that comes later. So what's your attitude towards the centrality mm -hmm. of democracy and human rights in that perspective of economic development? Yes. Yes, um, um, I believe that that view is uh, extremely elitist to start with. Um, the fact that the world has gotten to the point where we believe that human dignity is tied to money and is tied to economic wealth. So whoever can't afford three meals a day doesn't deserve to be treated right, doesn't deserve to have their rights uh, uh, respected, doesn't deserve to have a, a, a vote to choose their own leaders. But what people fail to understand is that the majority of the development problems and issues we are facing in the world today are tied directly to corruption and poor governance. And when citizens have the ability to hold their leaders accountable, uh, will uh, and have the capacity to change the leadership when they fail to serve them the way they deserve to be served, then things get better. But when you live in a country where the majority, the, in, the entirety of the politics is decided by a few who basically can rule as the witch with no accountability, they give themselves the right to, 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 to govern as they will because they know there will be no consequences for their action. So first of all, I believe that human rights is not something that is earned with money. It is something one is born with and one is entitled to regardless of their economic status. And poor countries deserve to be as democratic as any other country. Number two, I believe that without democracy, sustainable development is not very much possible. Yes, we have seen countries that are not democratic doing, making progress politically. But when we look at the most ancient democracies in the world, we have to be able to see if those dictatorial democracy, uh, 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 economies um, that are successful, or often called benevolent dictatorship, if they will survive through the hands of time. Um, but even if they do, the majority of countries living in, uh, 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 in poverty today are governed by autocratic regime. Actually, over 90% of countries living in poverty are governed by autocratic regimes, which, which means that autocracy and authoritarianism is tied to underdevelopment and, uh, and low human development index. So for us in Togo, we believe that our development goes hands in hands with democracy and we are not going to trace that and say let us let us afford food before we think about our rights we actually think that food is our right and we will fight for it as well um farida so you know one of the one of the you have some very harsh words on your blog towards the aid industry and the aid establishment and um uh, and some extremely funny uh, descriptions of naive, uh, naive uh, European well-meaning idealists who don't realize um, what, uh, you know, the, 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 the nature of what they're, the, the consequences of what they're doing is. What would you most want such 
European or American idealists mm -hmm. to actually do, to actually help to mm -hmm. in, in the sort of struggle that you and others are involved mm -hmm. in? Um, thank you, Tony. Um, uh, the one thing that I want to highlight is that the majority of the problems that are the solutions that are proposed by uh, philanthropists and humanitarian organizations are often placebo treatment. I do understand that when somebody is pain, then you have to find them a, 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 a painkiller to uh, to reduce the amount of pain they are they are feeling. But the wrong thing is to present uh, that uh, a, a, a painkiller as the main treatment that is going to cure the disease when the infection is still there and the person is still rotting. Um, and unfortunately, those humanitarian organizations, they try to, uh, uh, to, make, to, to touch the surface and give the impression that it is those small projects such as providing food and providing uh, uh, um, uh, um, healthcare or building schools in remote villages that are going to solve the poverty problem in the long, in the long run. When, if our resources were well managed and Africa wasn't losing over $1 trillion on a yearly basis to corruption, we wouldn't be needing that aid in the first place. Now, how do we tackle the corruption? You cannot tackle corruption. You cannot tackle uh, 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 um, uh, illicit financial flight uh, and mismanagement at funds without politics because the political systems are the one enabling the corruption. And sometimes European institutions are also accomplices in that corruption and in those abuses. So my, my advice to Europeans, Americans, people in the Western world who are who are naturally inclined to wanting to see the humanity get better and want to help people in Africa to go to the root cause and try to first of all understand the history of those countries and those people, understand uh, 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 the structure of power and the power dynamics of those countries and identify people who are working to uproot the, uh, 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 the inequality and work directly with those people. Because you cannot mask inequality. You can only uproot and, and, and remove it. Farida, thank you for those inspiring words. Uh, good luck in everything you're thank doing you. and, and all power to you. Thank you so much. It was really nice being here today. I really appreciate it.